and services here at the University of Limerick. Uh, straight to housekeeping, this event will be recorded. So just to let you all know that and the recording will be shared with attendees and those who've registered but can make it. Uh, we're absolutely delighted to be hosting this event um, in the library as part of UL's Research Week, which is an annual weekly, week long programme of events for researchers, both in UL and outside of UL. Um, and this event is the, the library uh, run event. And we're really thrilled to have two international speakers um, with us today and our head of research services here in the library as well. So the event, as you know, you've all signed up, is uh, focused on academic publishing, open research and the sustainable development goals. And uh, the format will be we have, uh, as I said, we have two international speakers, Vincent first, then Tiffany. Uh, both will speak for 20 minutes and will take questions immediately after each speaker. Anyone who wants to pose questions can do so in the chat. And then Ashling will provide a shorter presentation on the local UL context. And to end, if we have time, we'll have a panel discussion on the kind of key themes. So without further ado, I'm delighted to um, welcome Vincent Larivière, um, who is, he holds the UNESCO Chair on Open Science at the Université de Montréal, where he is Professor, Professor of Information Science and Associate Vice President Planning and Communications. He is also Scientific Director of RUD, Journal Platform, Associate Scientific Director of the Observatoire de Sciences et de Technologie, and regular member of the Centre Interuniversité de Recherche sur la Science et la Technologie. He holds a BA in Science, Technology and Society, an MA in History of Science, and a PhD in Information Science, and has performed postdoctoral work at Indiana University's Department of Information and Library Science. So we're thrilled that he's going to present today on the difference between openness with COVID scientific publications and climate and UN Sustainable Development Goals. So if you want to share your presentation there, Vincent, and over to you. There you go. So it should be working. Yes, perfectly. Yeah, we can see Excellent. You so thanks again for the invitation. Very pleased to be uh, with you today. Uh, so given that I only have 20 minutes, let's go to the to the heart of it. So I will start by talking about some issues with scholarly publishing and with open access in, in particular. Uh, then also a few words on the initial reaction to the pandemic by uh, by the research community and by publishers in, in particular. Uh, then I'll present some some results on on how basically we we collectively reacted to uh, uh, to COVID versus what we're doing for sustainable development goals research, which one could argue uh, is even more threatening or are issues uh, that are even more threatening than, than the COVID pandemic. Then I'll say a few words on, on preprint and national dissemination. Um, and then I'll conclude with some step forward about how to create a more equitable and sustainable uh, research dissemination system. Um, so as you're all aware, publishing is important increasingly important for for researchers right now um historically researchers would would publish when they when they genuinely had something to say right now i would not say that we don't always have something to say but there's pressure to publish uh, that are very important which means that um scholarly publishing is or publishing in itself is is a crucial part and you have to publish as a scientist uh even when let's say you're not totally done with with your research results and and so it's interesting to contrast that with Peter Higgs, uh, who passed away a, a few weeks ago and who won the Nobel Prize for his uh, theoretical work. Uh, Peter Higgs published his last paper in 1979 because he considered that he had nothing to contribute uh, to science anymore, at least in terms of, of publishing, which again reminds us that uh, one does not win the Nobel Prize or cure cancer or cure COVID because they have an H index of 200. One needs just one important paper to change the face of, of, of humanity. Um, and so I, I would also argue, and that's not the topic of the talk, but I think it has to be said that these pressure to publish probably lead us to publishing more uh, than we should collectively, which which leads to uh, to more more issues in research in general, uh, more issues of misconduct, etc. And of course, the context for that are quantitative research evaluation cultures uh, that have widespread throughout the world. Um, 
publishing is at the heart of most university rankings. Some countries have developed cash per publication policies uh, that, that, that that basically award uh, amounts that are as high as about $150,000 for papers in science and nature. And these are not for research funding, but th this is cash that goes in, in researchers' pockets. So again, that leads to, to, to more adverse issues than, than, than good things. So, so, so how much papers are we publishing collectively? Uh, basically, we've increased by about a factor of 10 in the last 40-ish uh, years. So from less than a million papers a year to almost uh, 8 million papers per year, which we are collectively uh, publishing. Um, and of course, that leads to intense pressure on the research system. We need to find referees to review those papers. And within those, we need to find the papers that are, that are of importance uh, for us. Um, and so this growth is is higher than the number of researchers that exist in the system, which means that researchers are increasingly productive. Uh, and one could argue as to whether we're actually, uh, despite the fact that we're publishing more, uh, whether we're actually discovering more uh, more more things. So who controls those scholarly papers? Now I'm, I'm entering into some of the issues associated with scholarly publishing. Um, so a couple of years ago, we wrote a paper showing that scholarly publishing was basically controlled by an oligopoly of a few uh, for-profit publishers. And, and the trend has, has not decreased in the last couple of years. Um, so basically in the natural and medical sciences, there's three publishers that basically control half of the research papers that are indexed in the web of science, which which means those are the journals that are the most prestigious uh, for for researchers. So Elsevier, Springer, and 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 Wiley Blackwell basically, and I'm saying Springer Nature actually uh, control half of the papers in the natural and medical sciences. And then in the social sciences and humanities, uh, the situation is slightly less concentrated, but still you have five uh, publishers that control half of the market. And so those publishers, of course. Um, charge huge amounts to libraries and also charge a lot for open access. And we'll get to that later in terms of what, what, what is the right way of disseminating in, in open access. Of course, um, there's disciplinary or specialty uh, differences in, in, in the control of, of, of journals. And I'll go quickly on that, but just to say that basically the fields where uh, there's less money like literature and fine arts and languages and, and performing arts. Th those are the fields where there's much less control by for-profit publishers of the ecosystem, while in other fields like social work planning, geography, criminology, econ, um, for-profit publishers are much more much more present. Um, so there's a diversity of, uh, of, of trends there, but there's one, um, could say common denominator, which is which is money. Uh, of course, in such a system where authors are not paid, where referees are not paid, uh, and and where editors in chief or editors at large uh, are rarely paid or they're paid quite quite marginal amounts, it's it's relatively easy to make uh, make a lot of money. So so the the publishing business, as you're probably all aware, is among those that are making the highest uh, profit margins. Uh, because also one could also add that the, the, the community that produces is also the same community that purchases and this community is dependent on on scholarly journals not so much for dissemination as i'll uh, argue later but much more for the symbolic capital and the prestige that is associated with the uh, with research publication so so that leads to profit margins as you can see on the on the panel b here uh, that are typically uh, between 30 and 40% and i am taking elsevier here because it's it's the biggest of those publishers uh, but almost all corporate publishers are in this realm of uh, of of profits uh, this leads, of course, to unsustainable um, expenses in terms of uh, of serials for for, for libraries, uh, and also leads to inequities across disciplines in the sense that many libraries, or at least it's the, it's the case in North America, uh, libraries don't have any money to purchase books anymore because all of the expenses are going on scholarly journals, and so it leads to basically spending more for the sciences that use journals, which are the natural and medical sciences, and much less for the social sciences and humanities, which are which are those that use books. So one solution or what can be seen as a as a as a solution to the to the control of, of research by by publishers is open access. So this started 
more than three decades ago, um, mostly in physics, um, energy physics, mathematics, uh, where re researchers in parallel with submitting their papers to the uh, to journals, deposited their papers to, uh, uh, to what was, let's say, online archives. Um, and so these physicists were mostly alone for, for almost a decade until basically the Budapest Open Access Initiative um, kind of crystallized what, what open access is. Uh, and so I'll, I won't read the full def definition, but basically open access means that researchers, actually anyone who can read and download the paper should have access to it. So it's immediate online access without restriction to the results of peer reviewed uh, research. So it's a pretty simple uh, definition. Um, but that said, there's many ways we can get there. And so I will just contrast two uh, open access mechanisms that exist uh, in, the, in the community. One is gold open access. And, and in that way of reaching open access, uh, the final version of the paper, the one that's on the journal's website, is freely available to, uh, to readers. Sometimes there's an embargo, and sometimes there's none, and sometimes there's a fee, and sometimes there's no fee. Uh, when there's no fee for the authors, uh, we call those Diamond OA uh, journals or Diamond OA publishing, which, which is kind of the, I would say, the new way of disseminating in open access. I, I, I would argue that it's been there for quite a while, but this is something that there's an increased awareness uh, on, on the issues actually that are associated with paying to publish, one of them being predatory journals, which I won't get into the details, but also the inequalities that it leads in the research system. Um, so just, uh, just a few words again on, on, on Gold Away. Uh, many for-profit publishers uh, allow for open access dissemination and are actually pushing for it, uh, but there's a cost to it. So, uh, and there's a huge contrast in the cost that is being uh, asked by for-profit publishers as well as non-for-profit publishers that exist in this uh, in this realm. So, not non-profit publishers like like Plus will ask for about fifteen hundred dollars uh, to publish uh, in open access, but for the same service you're going to pay twice that amount for most Springer and Wiley journals, um, and same for Elsevier. And if you want to publish in one of the nature journals in open access, that's going to be 9,500 uh, euros, which is basically about three times uh, what you would pay with the other journals. So so, so there's been a uh, commercialization or a uh, there's an economic aspect to OA publishing uh, that leads to a lot of inequalities. And so uh, this is something that we should advocate against and move towards uh, diamond OA journals, uh, in which case these journals have to be publicly subsidized. We can talk about that later in the question period. But in parallel with these ways of reaching open access, there's also green open access, uh, w which is obtained by basically self-archiving um, your own paper in, in basically any repository, just like the physicists were doing 30 years ago. And this is something that most journals, the vast majority of journals and publisher uh, let you do. So before delving into SDG and, uh, and COVID, we see strong differences in the proportion of open access adoption across disciplines. Uh, physics, given what I mentioned earlier, is pretty high, biological sciences, medicine, but most of the fields of the social sciences and humanities uh, remain quite close. And, and among the sciences fields that are quite low also in open access, there's chemistry and engineering, uh, which are disciplines where societies like the American Chemical Society or the uh, IEEE in engineering um, do not really have progressive uh, open access policies, mostly because they get a large proportion of their revenues through, uh, through research publishing. So, uh, so I want to emphasize that there's not only commercial publishers that uh, that have, a, I would say, not so progressive stance vis-a-vis OA, but there's also some, some uh, non-for-profit publishers. So, Early in the pandemic, you guys probably remember about, remember about four years ago, uh, the research community realized that it was important to disseminate science as openly as possible in order to reach import to to solve important problem. Um, and COVID was that problem that we collectively tried to solve. So both funders and publishers um, advocated for opening everything related to uh, to to COVID. So so back then I argued that that was great, but it was also, uh, there were other problems that we should probably try to solve with, with the same manner. So it kind of highlighted the fact that 
uh, publishers were not really coherent when it came to, to opening science and also acknowledged that closing science behind paywall led to issues in terms of scientific uh, progress. So for the next couple of minutes, I will show how they reacted differently uh, to, those two, uh, to those two scientific uh, set of, uh, of problems. Uh, but one thing that we also have to say is that the opening of COVID-related research was something that was kind of temporary. Um, so I made a few screenshots of, uh, so Elsevier created the coronavirus research hub early in the pandemic, and then um, that that's a, a screenshot from a couple of years ago. So after a year of free access to our tools, including too much extension, the research crisis is almost ending, and now we're kind of closing back things because this was something that was uh, temporary. Um, Springer also uh, did more or less the, 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 the same thing. Um, so there's a lot of papers that have been published on both COVID and, uh, and NSDG. So that's to, just to give you an idea of the of the volume. So we're, we're talking about, in terms of, of COVID-ish papers, about one quarter of a million. Uh, then there's a lot of papers in, on SDG3, SDG7, SDG16. Uh, so, so give or take, take, we're at almost a million paper a year. Uh, that are that, that that are being published on on SDGs uh, global, globally, and these again can be seen as the uh, biggest challenge that the world um, that the world has faced. Uh, so, contrasting openness in terms of COVID and SDG. So, so that's the COVID situation. Of course, as you can see from the previous figure. For early years, the number of papers is actually much lower. The, these are just papers related to coronaviruses in general, not necessarily to COVID, because COVID was not a thing before 2019. But if we contrast that with SDGs taken globally, we see that the vast, vast majority of those papers uh, remain uh, remain closed. So if you take the entire set of years, basically about, uh, about two thirds of papers are closed. Only in recent years, do we see that the majority of SDG papers are actually uh, actually open? So again, two, two reactions. One thing is a short-term emergency, we open everything. Other situations are long-term problem. These papers remain uh, remain closed. Um, now looking at the uh, the specific SDGs. Um, so again, for for more recent years, we're slightly above fifty percent of papers that are freely available. But if you take climate action and clean energy, where and th those I would argue are quite quite related, uh, it's about one paper out of two. So slightly less than a paper out of two in terms of clean energy, slightly more than a paper out of two when it comes to uh, to climate action. So climate change is seen uh, as probably the most threatening thing for the future of humanity. Uh, and this is a field where half of the research is not available for other scientists as well as the general public to uh, to access. Now I want to show how publishers reacted differently um, again when it comes to to COVID and uh, and again I'm taking the top three because as I mentioned those are the top biggest publishers in the sciences. Uh, so if you take Elsevier for instance about 90% of the COVID related papers were in open access. Many of them are closed right now. And if you take climate action, which is number three, and uh, number 13 about, I don't know if you see my, my, my pointer, but at the end of the first third of, uh, of SDGs, about one paper out of three. And you see the same for Springer Nature and the same for, uh, for, for Wiley. Um, and what is striking is, um, Oops, sorry. When you actually compare that with other publishers, so all of those that are not those three uh, top three publishers, we see that the vast majority of the research related to those SDGs is actually open. So um, for profit publishers, closing SDG related research and other publishers actually mostly opening it. Um, and especially that related to, uh, to, to, to climate action. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done on that front to improve accessibility for, for the work that is quite important. Uh, I just want to also briefly mention other things that we did in the pandemic that we should continue doing, but that we did on a temporary basis. 
Um, so early in the pandemic, many researchers realized that speed to publication was an issue. And so they disseminated preprints widely. And then very quickly, and it only took a few months, they went back to their, uh, their, their usual behavior, which is not to submit, uh, to submit preprints. Um, this is something that we collectively have to think about, whether we actually need to have the imprimatur of a journal before, uh, before seeing something out there. And, and there are strong arguments actually in favor of preprints. And the first one is that there's not a huge difference between the scientific content of a preprint and the scientific content of a peer-reviewed scientific paper. Peer review is mostly a filter, not so much a process that changes manuscripts that are being submitted. So, so this is from a, a piece by, by Jessica Polka and colleagues that basically show that between a published preprint and a published paper, there's about 60% of papers that don't change at all, and ad an additional 15% of papers that have roughly small figures rearranged, and only about 20% of papers have significant content that is uh, that is added. But that doesn't mean that the paper without this significant content is either wrong or not useful at all. So I think that clearly suggests that the publishing behavior that we had during the pandemic should probably be um, reproduced right now. Um, very quickly, I know that I have just a few minutes left. Uh, we also realized during pre the COVID era that there were issues in always submitting papers in English. That English uh, should not be the ling lingua unicus of the scientific uh, scientific system. Of course, we disseminate in English because it has greater prestige. Journals with impact factors uh, are mostly or almost always uh, always in English. Um, it means that at the world level, there's about 85% of papers that are that are in English, and this is made to at the extent of almost all of the other uh, other languages. Uh, and so, of course, this has adverse effects not available for most practitioners in many nations. Um, and. In China, it's interesting because early in the pandemic, the government was really angry about the fact that the first COVID papers papers was published in the in JAMA. So when the first team kind of uh, described the, the, the disease after going to to Wuhan, the first team of Chinese researchers, uh, they published a, a paper in the, in the, I think it was in, in in JAMA, and so it meant that the Chinese medical doctors, as well as other other policymakers, could not necessarily understand what was happening because the paper was was written in English. Um, so we need to realize that disseminating in a in multiple languages, not only in English, is the right way of making science more accessible. And this is especially too true for SDGs, which has a, which have a huge social component, and the general public needs to be able to access literature in their own uh, languages. Uh, so a few steps forward to conclude. So how can we make research dissemination more sustainable? Uh, the first thing we need to try to get back to a research dissemination system that is owned by scientists, not by for-profit publishers or any other entities for which their first goal is not science and the common good. Uh, it means that government need to make financial investment. Many of them are doing it. Uh, I would argue that the Canadian government is doing it in quite a good way uh, right now. Um, so we need to have these collective infrastructures for disseminating science so that researchers, when they want to be involved in scholarly publishing, can actually do it on platforms that they actually own. But we also have to reform research assessment. And so this is something that we've been reforming research assessment for <laughs> quite a while. Um, DORA is more than 10 years old. Uh, the research system is a big boat that does not move uh, very fast. But I would argue that it's everyone's responsibility to, research, to reform research assessment. It's not only scientists' responsibility. It's not only policymakers' responsibilities, but us as researchers. We're the one who generally evaluate our colleagues and we need to get rid of these various indicators that are not making us do science for the good reasons. Um, and if we are to develop new indicators, these have to be for common good. We need to um, generate a research behavior that is much better by, by researchers. And to conclude, we need to develop coherent policies, especially open access policies, um, given the fact that about half of papers for most countries uh, are published internationally. What's happening abroad 
changes the way we disseminate nationally. So different countries have to agree on open access policies and in a charitable manner, I would say reform university rankings, but probably get rid of university rankings. So uh, thank you very much and I'm looking forward to uh, questions. Thank you so much, Vansom. That was so interesting. Um, I would invite our attendees to please post questions into the chat if you have any. Um, while people are doing that or thinking of their questions, um, it's all very concerning, I have to say, Vansom. Yeah. Your, your data really is. But the, the thing that's most concerning that jumped out at me was the the most closed were climate change and clean yeah. energy. The, the two things that above all else seem more critical for us to okay. solve. And just could you just speak a little bit more about like are there are there you know reasons within those disciplines amongst those scientists um that need to be kind of addressed and how how can we encourage those particular subject mm -hmm. areas to be more open? Yeah, I, I, I think that that mo most researchers in those fields are actually aware of the importance of opening science. And in those fields, actually, they've developed many data, good data sharing practices. Uh, there's a network of, of, of various data gathering devices scattered across the ocean, and everyone can have access to the data that is, is being collected. So we're actually able to do science in a relatively open manner. Um, you, right now in those fields but research dissemination remains in the hands of these publishers and they are the one that control prestige so as long as scientists are stuck in this economy of prestige um, they will target the journals that are the most prestigious which are owned by these publishers so we, okay so so the thing that we need to do is not difficult well it's actually difficult but it's simple we control as scientists what prestige means prestige is a social construct We've decided collectively that nature was most prestigious, so we send them our best papers, which then reinforces the prestige of nature. But if collectively we say, well, it's actually the journals that are owned by this organization, which actually has science at heart and which tries to do the right thing, then that society or whatever would be better. And, and then the, an economy of prestige could continue, but we just need to change the original parameters there. Easier said than done, Vincent. We, uh, the, course, the whole the model, the publishing model is <laughs> very but it has difficult to, be said, to change. At least uh, we know, oh, it we does. know how to Absolutely. solve it, but yes. it's not so easy. Yeah, I yeah, agree. Yeah. Okay. Um, Question here. Uh, I noticed on one of your slides compared the three main publishers' COVID nineteen papers that there were a lot of bronze open access. Yeah. So what is your view on bronze open access? And you might define it for the benefit yeah yeah. So so about. bronze open access is a is a dissemination mechanism where there's no clear license in terms of, uh, of, of the, the article. So in gold open access, typically there would be a clear license that would say, here are here's the fact that the paper will be open forever, uh, and here are the reuse rights related to those papers. In terms of bronze open access, the algorithm shows that this paper is open, but we don't know for how long, and we don't know whether there's actually a license associated with it. And that is the mechanism that for-profit publishers, uh, that's the mechanism through which they have opened their papers during the COVID, which is why they could close it. It was just a temporary openness. So uh, so that's kind of, so I'm not in favor of bronze open access, of course, but it's better than, than closed access. Um, but the other thing that needs to be said on bronze open access is that there's many small journals that have open access forever, but for which it shows as bronze OA because there's no clear license. It was so. So the, the legal aspect is important, but it's especially important in the case of, uh, I would say, of for-profit publishers because it's uh, it's just a temporary act. And I need to mention also that <clears throat> these the slides that I presented are the open access status from about a year ago. And quite likely, in terms of COVID papers, there's less open access than what this uh, this shows. Sure, yeah, of course, yeah. One more question. Wouldn't rights retention and the automated, if possible, use of repositories do a lot to mitigate the problem? I Yes, so my, my suggestion is very simple on that front. We need to have stronger institutional open access policies. And of course, we need to have better funder policies, but the funder policies need to not orient us towards gold open access. It needs to orient us towards institutional repository or national repositories. Um, some 
institutions are enforcing that, but it's something that's, again, a bit difficult. I, I did not talk so much about open access mandates, but there's huge national variations on whether those work or, or don't work. In, in, in the United Kingdom, they work pretty well. In the US, they work pretty well. In Canada, they are a catastrophe because there's no monitoring. Okay. Um, okay. While in the US, for example, if you don't publish your paper on PubMed Central, you cannot ask for, an, for a new grant and your next installment of the grant could be cut. Um, so scientists, unfortunately, um, sometimes you have to, uh, <laughs> you, you need to do the unkind thing for them to change their behavior. <laughs> Indeed. So there are more questions coming in, but I think in the interest of time, some yeah. of them I think can be panel questions. So uh, I would like to thank you, Vincent, for that really fascinating uh, presentation. Thank you and so much. And we'll move on to our second speaker, Dr. Tiffany Straza. Um, so Tiffany, if you want to get your slides ready there, while I introduce you, Dr. Tiffany Straza is an open science consultant in the science, section of science, technology and innovation policy at UNESCO. A marine, a marine scientist by training, she holds a PhD in oceanography from the University of Delaware with a specialization in marine microbial ecology. She served as deputy, as deputy editor and statistician for the UNESCO Science Report 2021. Since 2022, she has been supporting the implementation of the UNESCO recommendation on open science, including the preparation of the UNESCO Open Science Toolkit and Open Science Outlook. This effort includes the development of guidelines, training materials, and best practices aligned with the values and principles of open science. Over to you there, Tiffany. Great, thank you so much, Chiara. Um, thank you for this invitation to speak today, and thank you to each of you here for sharing your time with us. Um, it's great to follow on Vincent's talk because I can skip, I think, some of my slides. Um, I think this is a, such an exciting topic um, because the, the Sustainable Development Goals they attempted to define this new pathway in a way of working together globally on challenges that are really interlinked. And I think we can learn from that lesson as we develop science and information systems instead of just making a new set of practices or rules for science. What can we do to transform the way that we do science, the way that we share science and the way that we use it? So we just heard from, from Vincent some of what's happening in open access to publications. And I'm hoping to draw your attention to the, the processes of science and the ways that we can open up uh, not just knowledge outputs, but the way that science is governed and developed. So I'm going to ask us today to consider what open science is, who gets to be a part of open science, and who benefits from open science from those changes in openness that we see developing around the world. Um, First, let's talk about why we would even want a change in science. We heard from Vincent the issues around knowledge outputs being closed, being behind paywalls for researchers, for the general public. Um, we also see that science is being conducted unevenly in terms of where the researchers are, where the money is coming from for science. Um, and the processes and tools. So the first image that you see here is the share of research spending uh, as a proportion of GDP. Um, actually, where I am I here? Uh, okay, the first one here is not spending, it's, it's researchers. Um, but you see the same pattern for both. These data come from the UNESCO Science Report in 2021, by the way. You see that the G20 countries still account for nine tenths of research spending, of researchers, of publications, and patents. And the same patterns are true for the tools and infrastructures that are used to conduct research. Um, again, there's this unevenness in terms of who has access to them, who is creating them, who has um, the ability to really use them to create and to share the knowledge that they have. And this is also true for science about the global challenges that are addressed by the SDGs. I'm going to skim through these couple of slides because Vincent has done such a good job explaining this, um, but just to note that the share of scientific publications in open access is rapidly growing. We see more people publishing in open access each year. 
but we still have a lot of work to do. Only a third of all scholarly publications since the year 2000 are currently under open access. So there is there is knowledge that uh, was published previously that we still need to work to open. And as Vincent said, the progress is different among different disciplines. The share of free to read publications when we look at the last decade ranges from over half of articles in biological sciences to just 21% in subjects like history. Some fields have more openness than others when it comes to uh, relevance to the sustainable development goals as well. 60% of scientific articles related to good health and well-being are in open access, but we should be concerned about the, the more than half of articles on clean water and sanitation that remain closed, or more than half of, of articles that address biodiversity management and life on land. Vincent showed us what a quick, quick reaction could be made in times of crisis in the context of COVID-19. So now our question is, which crisis matters? Whose crisis matters? Is that knowledge going to be available for the long term for other issues of urgency? And the, the other aspect to point out here is who is involved in this research? The number of publications uh, is is much greater when it comes to uh, the global north versus the global south. I use those terms um, very generally here. Um, but when we look at what what developing countries are focusing on proportionately, we see that there is a a stronger focus on topics, research topics related to the sustainable development goals coming from uh, developing countries. If they publish, they're more likely to publish on those issues. And yet the number of publications from developing countries on these topics is quite low. Uh, and again, it just doesn't match where the population is, where the knowledge is, and where the knowledge could and should be in terms of how we use science to address these challenges. So we have created a situation. I'm just going to pass over this one because uh, that's not, has discussed it. Um, so we've created this situation in which we have restricted access to the knowledge products of science to things like articles and data sets but also most of today's scientific knowledge is created inside institutions and it's published in outlets that require subscriptions or purchase to read our interactions within science can be haphazard many of the decisions to collaborate to work together or to share data are often made by individual researchers sometimes on their own. They don't always know if they have the support of their institution or their country to share knowledge in a particular way or to work together in a particular way. And a very small number of people are involved in making decisions about science. So these closed scientific practices amplify inequalities that exist between people and among countries. And of course, we, we need to remember that science is a tool and an approach, and we as a global community can test that approach. We can guide it in ways that serve more people more fairly. Um, and a, a system that keeps information and keeps the tools to create and use information for some and not for others is part of perpetuating inequities. And those inequities can drive conflict and they undermine efforts, not just for rapidly achieving these goals, but for a healthy sustainable and, and peaceful future together. So we're asking for open science as a contrast to what we see today and to do some very important things, to do things like increase access to scientific knowledge, as well as to improve the quality and efficiency of the scientific process. We see open science as a way to help us overcome these global challenges uh, faster and more fairly. Um, but it also, it, it leads us to uh, more expression of that fundamental human right that everyone has to freely share in scientific advancement and its benefits. That comes from the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So acknowledging that work uh, to change this system has been ongoing for decades in some areas, but is very new for some disciplines and for some parts of the world. So UNESCO became engaged because we saw there was this need for an international policy and action framework. For this work to be successful, it needs to be truly global. And that means that there's a need for a common definition of what we're aiming for in open science and how we're uh, assessing our progress to get there. Are we using shared value values and principles? So in 2021, 193 countries, beginning, by the way, with that recognition 
of the transformative potential of open science for reducing existing inequalities and for accelerating progress towards things like the SDGs. They recognize the urgency of addressing these, these complex challenges, but also these interconnected challenges for people and the planet. And they considered that open and more transparent, collaborative and inclusive scientific processes would create a more efficient enterprise that would improve science overall. For those new to uh, a recommendation, a recommendation with a capital R, it's a legal instrument. It's a negotiated text that sets out shared principles and norms. So countries commit to these shared principles and norms, and they also commit to a regular reporting process. In this case, every four years, countries are going to be checking in to show what they have done to make science more open. And that's happening this year. Uh, countries just adopted last month the survey that we're going to use to assess the implementation of this tool. And in February 2025, we'll be getting those first national reports coming in. So with the adoption of this recommendation, again, 193 countries have committed to, to doing things like promoting an enabling policy environment, um, investing in infrastructure for open science and investing in capacity building, as well as making sure that they do align incentives and promote innovation and cooperation in order to foster open science in such a way that it isn't creating impossible tensions on researchers and research systems. So we now have a shared definition uh, a normative framework and a common roadmap for action. I do want to address one important point here. When I say science, I don't just mean the natural sciences like geology or oceanography. Here in the recommendation, we use the word science to describe humanity's organized attempts to objectively study the world and to validate that knowledge through sharing of findings and data through things like peer review. And, and working in a coordinated way to test that knowledge. Some do prefer the term open scholarship, although not every person who conducts this form of organized knowledge custodianship would consider themselves a scholar either. So uh, again, please, please think broadly when we use these terms. What I want to point out here is that as defined in the recommendation, open science is about making scientific knowledge more accessible and reusable for everybody but that's only part of it open science is also about increasing collaboration and making sure that we use this information for the benefit of science and for society it's about opening up the processes of scientific knowledge creation of evaluation and communication and that means opening up not just within our conventional scientific community but also to broader society um, where knowledge that can benefit our sciences and certainly where application of the knowledge is going to be essential to, to create progress towards our global challenges that we face. And we see efforts across these four pillars of openness, open scientific knowledge, open scientific infrastructures, open engagement of societal actors and open dialogue across knowledge systems. So in other words, we're talking about openness in knowledge production as well as in knowledge dissemination, making sure that there's room for diverse voices to be heard when we're designing scientific initiatives as well as when we apply that scientific knowledge later on. Here we go, I think I've said that one. Um, so this all rests on a set of shared values and principles. And we see that in order to create the transition that we need, this isn't just about rules. It's not a, a new set of tools and rules for science. It is a way to transform science in uh, as, as needed within local context and in recognition of the resources available in local context, but in line with these shared values and principles that make sure we're all making progress in the same kind of direction. And this requires a shift in the culture of science. We want to shift from just focusing on co competition to also using effective ways of cooperation to reduce those inequities. We want to change from viewing science as a, a product, as a commodity, and viewing science as a process and as a, 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 a common good that will be validated and tested and applied by a, a broad and diverse community. We want to make sure that we don't have just science for a few people, we have science for everyone. So that's all a lovely vision that was adopted in November, 2021. Um, so at the end of last year to check in, to, to collect inputs from around the world and to, to assess a baseline so that we can look at change over time, uh, 
at UNESCO, we produced a global assessment called the Open Science Outlook, and this was building on input from, from experts around the world. We completed this assessment to identify and report on shared indicators where they exist, but also to guide our next steps towards inclusive open science that can be informed by effective monitoring for the purpose of improving science overall. And there were four key messages that I want to point out from this effort. The first is that for open science to be really effective, it needs to be really global. It needs to be really equitable. Open science that's just for a few is not open. It is still closed off to uh, the people who have the information and knowledge that we would all benefit from and for those who, who really need that knowledge. Um, we know that context matters here because context affects our experience of science and it also affects then our priorities for open science. There are some uh, deeply felt barriers to open science and some real hesitation in sharing knowledge openly. And we need to be frank about those, confront those and understand who is setting norms and practices for science, who is creating and having access to the systems, what happens to knowledge when it is shared and who benefits from that sharing. These questions have big implications for equity in open science, as well as for its sustainability over time. We do know that there is increasing adoption of open science practices globally. Many different countries are putting in many different tools and processes um, coming from research communities, coming from institutions, sometimes coming from the government level. But we do see that this growth is not uniform. Some regions and some disciplines show remarkable progress, but there's still disparities between countries and communities, many of which are in line with existing inequalities in science, technology and innovation. Um, Vincent has also pointed out the differences among the areas of, of, of disciplines. Um, we see similar differences among the pillars of open science. So this assessment helped us understand those enabling factors for the transition to open science, including its cultural transition that we need to make. As Vincent said, we've created a culture of prestige and the structures that underpin it. And we should question those as science transforms. Um, the, the recommendation has seven areas of action, and that can provide some structure, certainly at the national and institutional level of what we can do to speed up this transition. And we do see value in collective and collaborative action to make sure that that transition is faster and it is more fair to bring more people along the open science journey. Um, it's possible as we, we tried within this report to look at the benefits of open science. There are benefits at many different levels um, from individual all the way up to global. And these benefits cover a range of moral considerations and practical considerations. This is important because if we're trying to convince people to make a change, we need to show what the real costs are, what the real benefits are, um, because openness will not just happen if we ignore it or, or if we allow it. We need to understand what we are aiming for and use these as a way to make careful decisions about how we assess science, how we understand it, what kind of benefits we're asking for from the scientific infrastructures and systems that we create. And I want to point out that there are th these benefits and the practices that bring them about are diverse and Open science is not just one piece. There are multiple pathways to different openness in different areas of science. So there's this spectrum of openness and practices and benefits along the spectrum are in reach of everyone. Um, and you'll see as this is evidenced by some of the case studies that you can read in the Open Science Outlook publication. Looking at things like publications, we do see signs of growth, even as monitoring is still in its early stages for other aspects of scientific knowledge products. We do see a growing amount of, of research data being shared, um, more research data policies based around sharing. We see more licensing of open hardware designs. Um, we see the emerging practice of recording a piece of software as a research output, for example. But one thing we know is that just counting contributions just counting things like pieces of software is not enough to assess the openness of science. We need to pay attention to the quality and the reusability of shared knowledge products. And in the context of open science and its values and principles, we should also consider the diversity of who is creating and who is using the 
things like the software and source code used to create and conduct science. So we need to consider how we're opening up scientific practices and what impacts those change have been those changes have depending on the approaches that we take. Um, again, from the previous talk, we heard that a range of mechanisms can be used to provide open access to publications, and those different mechanisms have different consequences in diverse local contexts, particularly when they relate to costs. So we do seek progress in, in all these areas of open science, not only to open access to publications, but also to, to sustainable infrastructures, to engagement, and to dialogue across knowledge systems. We don't have perfect ways to measure uh, our progress in each of these areas, but we do hear clearly that we need to strengthen this focus on processes and on the people who do science and who use science. I think it's also valuable for us to consider when people are engaged in science. Are we asking people just to receive and transmit knowledge, receive a publication, share a publication, or uh, participate only in communication at the end of a research process? That's different, that's good, it's necessary, it's important, but are we also asking people to create knowledge with us? Are we asking them to participate in making decisions about science, about what we study, and about how it is funded and managed? I hope that you can see that in the context of addressing societal challenges, such as climate change, such as the biodiversity crisis, and so on, there is value in creating engagement earlier in the process so that the knowledge is stronger, we have a better product at the end, and also so that it is more likely to be applied to directly inform management decisions and to affect people's lives. So how do we get there? Um, open science is not just about changing methods. It demands this profound cultural shift in scientific communities worldwide. And this cultural shift can occur in a supportive practical framework. We consider these uh, six key ingredients for progress. We see a key role for policy, both in making requirements for open science and in creating supportive frameworks where researchers aren't in intolerable tension. We need to critically consider incentive systems to promote open science to make sure that we're not um, stretching researchers in two different ways as they meet other demands. We still need a lot of capacity building to make open science understandable and valued. We can take advantage of some amazing advances in shared infrastructure and practices to make open science easier for all, to make sure that it is the default option. And of course, open science needs investment to thrive. Um, significant gains may be made through reallocation of existing resources. Um, and we need to monitor our progress, including making sure that the ways that we choose to open our science don't have unintended consequences or, the, or that we can manage those unintended consequences to really advance the, the diversity and the equity that we see within science. These uh, practical actions that we see, um, again, they're guided by the seven areas of action set out in the UNESCO recommendation. Um, and they provide this structural framework for transforming science. At UNESCO, we have five working groups tackling these big challenges, working together to exchange best practices from around the world in different contexts to develop guidance and advance in these areas. And I would encourage you to join us. Um, and I want to mention here that Ireland has, has some key ingredients already. Um, you, you do have a national action plan set out. You could take advantage of that. Um, there are other related areas or, or subsections where there's guidance to advance openness, equity and efficiency and transparency in science. Just because it's new, I thought I'd mention here the UNESCO call for action on closing the gender gap in science, which sets out some key steps for enriching our scientific community and for making sure that more people have a chance to participate. Um, I think I'll pause there because I, I would love a chance to discuss. So thank you for your time today. I just want to note that the, the recommendation has been adopted by nearly 200 countries, including Ireland. So it is your recommendation as well. And I hope that you can find inspiration in this collective effort to, to open science, to make it more equitable around the world. Um, and thank you for your work in shaping the scientific landscape. Thanks. Thank you so much, Tiffany. That was fascinating. Um, and I would encourage the audience, if you have questions, just to put them in the chat. Um, in the work that you do, Tiffany, um, I'm wondering what do you think is the most impactful uh, in terms of furthering open science at, at a, a national level? Like the, the national reporting mechanisms are fantastic. That's a fantastic way, I think, of providing a global effort. 
Uh, but are is there are there key elements that you've kind of highlighted all all together that you think one or two are really the absolute keys in a country? It's an interesting question because it does depend on local context. So there's um you're right that national monitoring has the advantage of drawing high level attention to this issue and it can speed up a lot of process. I think we'd benefit from advances in policy. At the same time, open science in many areas started from the bottom up. And in that case, you have this, this push for change um, that is already affecting how researchers conduct their day-to-day -day work. And that is tremendously powerful. If we only had top-down rules coming down, we'd have to do a, a huge amount of work just to get that cultural change and people might feel resistant to working openly. If we only had bottom up, then we we lack perhaps uh, investment in in sustainable infrastructures, things like that. I mean, and that's what we had. That's what we had was uh, uh, more of an emphasis on bottom up, and we saw a need for collective action, which is what instigated the work that has has resulted in the recommendation. So, in terms of what is needed, what's most effective for each area, it is dependent upon your local context. What is your situation? What are the existing inequities and challenges that you see within your scientific community? That's going to be different for Ireland than it is from in in Ghana or in Tuvalu, right? Um, and I think what's to me very positive is that no matter the situation, whether or not you have political buy-in yet or whether or not you have an infrastructure yet, there are steps that you can take to improve open science and you can can now hold your country to account as it were for this recommendation to say we are making steps as a research community in this area. We want this kind of coordinated support, this kind of permission, this kind of, of framework at the national level as well. I hope that answers part of it. Yeah, it does. And do you think with um, the UNESCO's approach, Vincent mentioned differences in policy across countries and across institutions. Does UNESCO's approach offer an opportunity to kind of reduce those differences and, and have a commonality of policy uh, for a global effort, do you think? Right. So we're asking for harmonization there. And I think it's it's interesting to see, as we pointed out in the outlook, it's interesting to see the steps that people are taking in policy. We had the development in many countries of an open access policy, only looking at publications, right? And then a data policy, only looking at data. And what we're seeing now, I think, is really positive not just creating a broader open science policy that addresses things like public engagement and uh, researcher incentives and so on, but rather looking at the science, technology and innovation system and transforming it through bringing in openness. Let's not create open science as another subset of science or a new tool, new separate thing that we have to fund separate from the science that we're already doing. Rather, let's tweak our existing science, technology, and innovation systems and our existing policies and policy instruments there to make sure that openness is possible, is easy, um, and is rewarded for researchers and for institutions. Thank you, Tiffany. So in the interest of time, I'm going to move on now to Ashling, who will just, uh, Tiffany and Bansant have given a fantastic kind of world view of, of open science, but as it's research week at the University of Limerick, Ashling Hayes, our head of research services in the library, will give a more local perspective of UL and of Ireland. So as head of the department within the Glucksman Library, Ashling oversees a team that's responsible for developing and delivering specialist and innovative services to faculty and researchers at UL. Uh, she covers and her team cover areas such as research data management, bibliometrics and impact, research collections development, evidence-based research methods, and scholarly communications and open science. She's previously worked in Trinity College Library, and she has experience in researching, research profiling, capturing, and measuring research outputs, and has implemented several digital information and repository services, and contributed to policy development um, nationally on open science, research data management, and open publishing through national and international collaborations. So over to you, Ashling. Thanks, Kira. Uh, so just hoping now that you can see my slides there. So let me know if you can't. Uh, we can't so on the... yes, we can't, Ashling, yes. Sorry, right. in there. And now I have a red box, and so I'm going to presume. Good now, yeah, we're good now. 
Yeah. So thanks. thanks everyone. And I really thank you to Vincent and Tiffany for their really eye-opening presentations at a, at a global level of where we are with, with, with open science. I think there's always a bit of, um, uh, we all tend to look a little bit at our own research bubble and what we're doing within our own universities and within within our own department, departments even. So to see at a global level what's going on and to have a, have a, have a light shone it in that way is, is really interesting. As Kira said, I'm going to take a local perspective as to what is going on here in UL and also in, in Ireland. So, Vincent, I'm not going to dwell here. We know that there are tensions in academic publishing at the moment with that huge pressure to, to keep publishing, to publish more. Our funders are looking for immediate open access, which we, of course, support. We have to question how sustainable gold and particularly hybrid gold open access is. And then there's the big question of who's going to pay for pay, pay for all this if, if that, is, that is the case. So. Just to kind of set the scene and here in, uh, from a national perspective, we have our National Open Research Forum, which is North, which was established in 2017. We published a landscape report in 2021 and a number of policy briefs in 2021. And it, it out of that came our National Action Plan, which is from 2022 up to 2030. And one of the key aims of this, not the only one, is to achieve 100% open access by 2030. So in six short years, we want to be at 100% open access. Along with that, there has been funding. Um, firstly, so, some to develop a national open access monitor. We have funding for Diamond OA open access feasibility studies and lots more. There is plenty of funding and plenty uh, and a number of different initiatives that, that that are ongoing to help us to achieve that 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 uh, that that aim. And we also have quite a bit of government funding around read and publish deals or tran transitional agreements, as we as we often call them. And these are meant to be temporary and transitional. We want to flip our hybrid journals, those journals where we are both paying subscription and paying for open access to gold so that we are only paying for one thing. Uh, and we want to ideally just use the subscription funds to pay to pay for open access because we are paying a very high price for those. And what we've noticed with most of those being published, they don't cover gold open access journals. Now, some do, uh, but the vast majority do not. Uh, so just keep to keep that in mind where we are with those and what the impacts of those deals have had here in UL. So overall, this is UL's total numbers of publications from 2018 to up to 2023. And I've used 2018 deliberately because this was the year the first, the last year before we had our first open access or transitional agreement come in in 2019. So we can see that we have had a steady, fairly steady increase. We had in 2021 a, a, a spike, which is a COVID spike is what, is what we call it. And we came back down again in 2022, but we've started to rise again in 2023. And that's very much linked to what Vincent was saying earlier, where there is a pressure to continue to publish. So our, our total number of publications is on a trajectory to keep going on and on and on. And we will relatively soon probably pass uh, that COVID spike again as, as normal. And this is our total percentage of open access here in UL. So back in 2018, we had nearly 52% of our publications that were open access. Uh, so that's quite, quite good. In 2022, we had 67% of, 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 of our publications that, that are open access. And that's gone down again in 2023. That percentage has gone down again in 2023. So why is our percentage actually plateauing? So we should we would be expecting us to keep going upwards, upwards, upwards in line with, with our publications, but that is not the case. And the reason for this is if we take our breakdown of open access here in UL, and back in 2018, 84% or almost 84% of our publications were open access via the green open access route. So by depositing a, a version of the a version into, into the local, rep local repository here. For 2023, that is reduced down now to 67, almost 68 percent. So we're, that that green open access is actually coming down. Conversely, what is growing hugely is our hybrid open access. So our hybrid open access has gone from 9.6 percent up to 47.78 percent. So that's a direct result of these open access deals that we're doing. And overall. That is fantastic. We are delighted to finally see or just, just to see our subscription funds being used in this way. But why is it happening at the expense of green open access? And why can these two not live together? And that's a question that we really need to be asking. What is going on? Why is our green open access, which is a very straightforward way to make your publication open access from the researcher's point of view? There's a lot of support. So why is that not coming down? And it's something we need to really start thinking about. So what we've learned is that 
the green oak is declining. And one of the things that we have noticed is that we are now seeing longer embargo periods from many of our large publishers, up to 36 months. So funders are saying, well, we we, we want to see your publication immediately. And the and the and the, the large publishers are saying, yeah, unless you pay for that, you can't you, you have to wait for 36 months. Uh, so we're seeing a real tension there. We're also seeing the most recent one is the idea of an article development charge. Uh, daylight robbery, I think we might as well call it uh, at, at this stage. This is where I, an article development charge is put in for a, somebody submitting a, a submitting a paper to, to an article. And if they want to use rise retention, then they will be charged an article development charge. Bearing in mind, as we've as it's already been mentioned today, a huge amount of the work in the uh, all the work in peer review, a large amount of the editorship is done for free uh, by many, but for, for many of these, the, these, these journals. We know that our hybrid goal is expensive and it's also limited. We only have so much money, so we can only pay for so many articles. OK, our deals cover a certain amount of articles. It's not a percentage. It is a, a finite amount. And so as we publish more, if we are unable to, to, to leverage our green open access, our percentage of open access will not increase further. And we need to be aware of that. JISC did a review of transitional agreements just this year. And they've recent, very recently published, and what they said is that it's going to take 70 years for the big five publishers to flip their transformative agreement titles to open access at the rate that we, that we are going, because there is too large a gap there be, uh, between those of us that have them and don't. So it's going to cost too much money. So the thing is, how can we move forward sustainably? We still want to get to 100 percent by 2030. So how are we going to do that? And as mentioned, I think Tiffany, you you really went into this really well. Rewarding the full research process is is that is the start of it. We know that research integrity is at the very heart of open science. Being open about the full research process is good for research, and we need to continue to publish the whole research process. That includes our data, the negative results, how we did how we did the how we did the research. Everything needs should should should, should be should be published, and our funders' policies are starting to actually acknowledge this. So the most recent um, Plan S vision is of a community based scholarly communication system that shares the full range of their research outputs. And here in UL, um, Science Foundation Ireland, who is a, which is a Plan, a, a Plan S signatory, will be one of the major funders of, 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 of our research. So for them to say this to us means that we need to support that. We need to be able to support the sharing of the full the full range of, of their research outputs. The Bill and Melinda Gates, another recently published po policy, and they have said that they have come out and said that they want their work that, that, that the work that they fund to be posted as preprints and they no longer will cover fees for the publication in academic journals. So that's it. They want to post, do, do, do through the preprints. And this would be very much in line with Plan U. Um, what was purported would be that if all agencies were to mandate the posting of preprints by grantees, uh, an approach we turn Plan U for Universal, the free access to the world scientific output for everyone will be achieved with minimal cost and effort to the researcher. So it wouldn't be with minimal. We do know there are costs to green, to green, to green open access, but it will be minimal cost and effort to, to, to the researcher. So how do we as a library support this and as a library community? And I think everyone will be able to recognize the next slide and saying that we all do this too. anyone who here from the library community. We provide curated value added services in our research repository here at UL. We check publication alerts, we check the copyright, we determine the versions, we communicate with the researchers, we place embargoes on material, we bring in not we bring in non-standard material, we take in theses, we put we create portfolios, we offer consultation on non-traditional research outputs, that whole research process. And one thing that we've brought in recently in the last year is that we now link the stay and development goals to all publications coming into the repository. So we will take we, we will enhance the records with with that with that with that that information. We also provide technical repository services. Um, more, I suppose, more linked on almost to publishing services. We issue DOIs, we issue ISBNs, we will link to funding, partnership and projects. We provide all metrics, and and of course, we we include our repository profile, so you can you can archive your whole research um, output under under a profile and link this, of course, to 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 your ORCID. 
So really, I suppose what I want to say is that we kind of need to get back to the future. And we want to, I'd like to see us move back towards that 2018 number where 84% was green, was green open access. If we can leverage that, we can start move, making large strides towards that 2030 goal of 100% open access. Uh, and I've just said, give some reasons as to why I think I, I think green open access is the most sustainable uh, type of open access. But I'm not the only one that thinks this. And this is going. This is my last slide. So this recently published paper in Spring in Springer Nature showed that not only is um, green open access sustainable uh, from our point of view, but it shows that a stronger effect. Um, uh, a stronger interdisciplinary effect um, than open access via publisher partner partners. So what we were seeing was that where the citations that came from open access through open access papers that are open access in in, in repositories came from both greater disciplinary from a great a wider range of disciplines. So more disciplines were getting to were getting to were getting to see those papers, and it was coming from a much wider range of countries. So this is a key part of, I suppose, making science work to solve the wicked problems of the world. For that to happen, we, this has shown how repositories are at the heart of getting science and getting research to more diverse populations and to, and to, and to more diver, diverse um, disciplines. So I'm going to finish there on that. Thank you very much, Ashling that uh, brief run through in the UL context and for highlighting the research repository, which, which for our UL researchers, uh, for anyone interested in publishing openly or asking anything about this, everything that we've talked about today, do get in touch with the library and Ashley's team will take you through all the services that we offer. Um, Ashley, there is a question, but it's quite a technical question, I think, in the chat. So I'm going to leave you to respond to that in, in the chat uh, rather than read it out. Um, and then for the last uh, 15 minutes or so, I'd just like to invite our three speakers back um, to uh, the platform. Tiffany, if you want to switch back on your camera and unmute yourself for just a general um, kind of musing about the kind of things that we're talking about today. Um, so one of the things that strikes me, getting back to openness as it relates to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, it seemed to me that, it seemed very clear to me that uh, openness really in some ways saved the world when it came to COVID. Uh, without that open sharing of science at a very fast pace, who knows where we would still be. Um, and I wonder if that understanding is absent when it comes to the other world wicked problems that that link between open sharing of science and solving climate change and world hunger, uh, water clean, cl cleanliness, that kind of thing, is there something missing? And is well, how can we deepen that understanding um, to add some momentum to uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals? Uh, Bansant, can I direct that at you first? Yeah, that, that's actually a good question, but I think this goes beyond scholarly publishing. COVID changed all spheres of societies. Of, of societies plural, actually, of all countries. Everyone uh, collectively tried to work to, to solve that. It, it changed the way we were working. It changed the way society was organized. Um, most of the SDGs are long-term problems, which means that our societies and political systems seem not to be very well equipped to, uh, to, to solve those. And I, I'm sorry to say that. And again, this goes beyond it's a political science, sociology, economic problem. Um, and unfortunately, it percolates into scholarly publishing. But I think the scientific community should actually be at the forefront and say, OK, if the political sphere cannot, cannot solve it or at least work positively towards that, then at least in our uh, field, we will try to do it. Um, so I, I think it's probably a matter of, of course, convincing scientists, but also uh, scientists being aware of their impact on society and how they, they, they can actually maximize it. Tiffany, Ashling, do either of you want to comment? Sure. <clears throat> I would just add a little bit. Um, I agree with what Vincent said. Um, but let's think beyond publications as well. To give you another perspective of what happened here, for science journalists, people who science communicators, people who were trying to 
support decision makers and people at home in their response to something like COVID-19. Um, the sudden increase in open access and the use of preprints in particular was on one hand a gift because there was this rapid uh, wealth of information. And on the other hand, it was extremely difficult. They pointed out some of the deficiencies or the weaknesses that are there in terms of the flow of information in science communication systems and the um, the capacities of people like science journalists who found themselves overwhelmed and asked to deliver um, on uh, things where they didn't have support perhaps for data visualization or data analysis, dealing with these large data sets and these, these preprints that were there um, without having that peer review process. So what we've learned from that, I think, is that we still need we still need things like peer review. We still need um, effective ways of communication from researchers. And we benefit more from, from that engagement, from having not just stuff available on the internet, but rather a, a more engaged process where people have access to it, but they also have access to the expertise, the, the relationships uh, with with people, with institutions to be able to use that, be able to use it well in context. So let's let's focus on sharing information, yes, but think about who is receiving it, how they're receiving it, what else they need in order to use it. Thanks. Ashley? Yeah, I, I, I suppose I'm struck by what was mentioned earlier, but that science needs to be not just be in English and that that is actually a very important part of this, that to, you know, to, to actually fix wicker problems, it's practitioners who are going to actually do this. It is not the scientists and those of us who, who, who those of us who work, who work in, work, work in academia. And we need to continue to promote bibliodiversity. And that's very important. There are numerous small publishers out there, some of them in libraries, many of them not in libraries, many of these are, they have been publishers all of their life and they need support. They are finding it increasingly difficult to kind of keep up with everything. And at times, forcing open science and open access on them can mean the difference between a profit margin and not for and not for them. So we do need to find a way to be sustainable to ensure that we, we maintain our, bi our bibliodiversity and support the, these publishers so that there are numerous avenues uh, and ways for us to communicate research and that we can we can make use of them all. Absolutely. Uh, let's talk about incentivizing open access and incentivizing researchers to publish openly. Um, there's many, this is kind of debated around HR policies, around promotional policies, um, around the, the citation, you know, kind of in, uh, the word, emphasizing the beneficial citation impact for publishing open. Um, have Vincent or Tiffany, have you seen really good practical incentivizations in, in, in any of your work that you think really, yeah, that, that's, that's been very effective in incentivizing researchers to publish openly? Tiffany, maybe to start? I think, again, I would have to go a little bit beyond openness there. We're seeing some really interesting uh, ideas and, and shifts in HR policies, essentially, and, and advancement policies looking at the a more complete picture of a researcher's research and, and daily life. So rather than only looking at publications or looking at education and publications and, and these, these markers of status, looking at how they're engaging with different communities, what work they are conducting and what that is, is producing. Um, you know, things like recognizing software outputs as a research product, recognizing time spent in communities, co-designing or creating participatory methods, recognizing that as part of the research story. I think that's very positive. But restricting it just to, uh, you know, incentives to publish openly, um, it has to be easy. It has to be possible. If there is a cost um, sometimes, again, researchers don't always know what support they really have from their institution. Um, and in some cases, depending on where you are in the world, maybe your research funder demands open access publishing, and maybe they will allow you to spend a proportion of your grant, the, the funding that you receive to do that research. Maybe you could set part of that aside 
for to cover the cost of that publication. But that isn't true in all cases. And there are some people who, for moral reasons, do not want to publish. Even if they have payment to publish in a certain way, they may or may not wish to follow that route, um, given their concerns about, about equity and who really has access to it in the end. So we do need to, um, I think, again, we can, we can benefit from the best practices that we do see around the world. Um, looking at Latin America, where they have shared infrastructures for publishing and researchers publish in those journals and are not uh, disincentivized to do so. If they publish in those journals that are built using shared infrastructure, they still have a good chance of career advancement. The issue really comes when we uh, create a system where you have to pay in a certain way, this is where the cost is, in order to get this particular kind of output and that's the only one that will allow you to essentially continue doing the research that you think is important and valuable. That's the part that's unsustainable. Thanks. Vincent? Yeah, very quickly, I think Tiffany's right. First, we need to rethink what's an, what is an ideal researcher. Uh, the, the ideal researcher is not necessarily the one that publishes 50 papers a year. It may be the one that actually writes in journals that are not in English and that actually tries to solve the problems of the place where they are located. Uh, there's many parts of the world that have, and I would say that I hate that term, but for in the South that, that have used the criteria of the, of the North, that their institution want to increase in university rankings, which actually is totally not making any sense. It doesn't make sense in the North, but it's even less so makes sense uh, in, in the South. So we need to think, what is it to be a successful researcher and doing again, science for the right reason, not, not for indicators. So we need to get rid of that. In terms of places that have worked, and this is an old example, but I think it's still relevant. There's a university in Belgium, the University of Liège, where basically for any evaluation, they don't ask faculty to provide their CVs or anything. They are looking at the papers that were put in the institutional repository, period. So the institutional repository is the space where, uh, where papers are deposited in green open access. Mm. which means that they don't have to spend. This is something that, that maybe was not emphasized enough. Gold open access in a system where authors are paying makes leads researchers to actually take the money that should go to the students mostly. Uh, when you ask for funding in most fields, of course, sometimes it's to buy equipment, sometimes it's to give conferences, but most of it goes to students. So you're taking money that's supposed to go to students and you're funding publishers that are actually already being paid through the library subscriptions. And so uh, this is something that ethically is really debatable. And I'm really surprised why students are not outside in the streets uh, protesting uh, for that. Maybe the last thing I, I, I want to say, um, uh, no, I'll stop here so that there's more questions. OK, I'll stop here. I think they're not out on the streets because it's just so complicated to explain, to understand. And, and that's part of the problem, I think. Uh, it's just not simple. Before yeah, I go maybe, to Ashling with that, yeah, go ahead. But I want to say I want to say one thing. Sorry, because we're putting a lot of things on the shoulders of researchers, and I would yeah. argue that researchers are busy. Yeah. Researchers should not be caring about scholarly publishing. Librarians, researchers on the topic like me, should be caring about that. But researchers should be just submitting their papers where they think is the best fit. They should not think about indicators, and they should not be worried about APCs or whatever, which means that it's, an, it's our responsibility to solve that. We need to solve both the research evaluation system as well as the scholarly publishing system. It's not an easy task, but I, I, I think we need to be careful and putting everything on the shoulder of researchers where they should be responsible and etc. They should be the best research, to be doing the best research that they, that they need to, not so much focusing on where to publish. Oh, that's a very good point. Before I go to Ashling, if anyone would like to add a question into the chat, please do for our last few minutes. But Ashling, do you want to comment on incentivization? Yeah, I think again, it, we need to make it easy. And I think that that is the, the most the most important thing. Even when it comes to our read and publish deals and our go to open access deals, they're not easy. You know, I'm constantly fielding questions and kind of going, well, is this journal covered? Will we have a budget for it this year? Or what happens if I if it's accepted in the, ne the next year? It's not easy. It really, you kind of feel, I do feel at times that we're almost playing a game with publishers, like a bit like whack-a-mole. We kind of fix one thing and then something else pops up like an article development charge. And we have to say, how do we work together as, uh, and I think like 
through what Tiffany was saying with, with, with UNESCO, providing that kind of a coordinating ability that we work together as a global system to say we want to communicate in a certain way. We need to make it easy. We want to support our researchers. They want to make they want to make their work openly available. It does have to be done in a way that that makes it that makes it makes it easy. We are seeing some green roots and green shoots uh, coming out when we see what our funders are doing in, in looking for narrative CVs, trying to remove metrics from these. They just want to tell us that, but tell, tell, tell us about the impact of your work. We're seeing some re really, re really good work there. Also, we see the likes of COARA, uh, you know, the, for a reforming research assessment. We're also seeing it, but there is a big divergence between those things and the rankings. And I think that's where we are. There's a bit of a collision ahead. Yeah. OK, so it might be, it sounds like preprints. We're back to preprints and preprints is where open sharing started 20 years ago, even longer than that. So uh, maybe preprints is where the future, we may reach 100% open access into the future through preprints before the, the work enters into the marketplace or the commodified marketplace. Um, I think we're uh, coming up to um, uh, the finish of the session. I know we're all on different clocks. So I just want to thank our speakers again. Um, it was a fantastic session and I'm really, really grateful to uh, Dr. Vincent Larivillier, Dr. Tiffany Straza and to Ashling Hayes here from UL for joining us in this uh, session. Now, I know somebody has asked about the recordings and how they'll be made available. I don't actually know the answer to that, but they will be made available to participants and to the many who registered to listen to them uh, later on, uh, to listen to them back. So uh, without further ado, I'll close the session thanking our speakers and our audience and wish you all a very good evening. Thank you.